Budget Advisory Committee. We're going to call this meeting to order. All right. So, all right. We will start off our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get to public comments, just as a heads up, I apologize. I forget sometimes I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so I got some calls about the supplemental requests, um, the cases that I, I usually like go through them and you know grade them like one to four, and uh, the cases that put numbers to it and things like that. And I didn't like prep everyone here, giving them a heads up that we have more supplemental requests this year than I have seen in like, sorry, $34 million is a large amount of supplemental requests, seven pages of them. So there was several questions and I apologize. I, I thought we'd get to that junction tonight. But for those of you who are working on your homework, yes, occasionally Eric and I will try to, you know, put things out there to try to help um, provide you with information and, and resources and suggestions. But everyone has their own process and we encourage you to find your, your own best way. And we also want you to come back. So next year, you'll be much more prepared. But like, trust me, 34 million and seven pages of supplemental requests was a lot of homework to do. Not that's an excuse. You know, Addie, you know, Riley, I, I did my homework, just in case. All right. It's 602. And in a sense, this is the juncture where we ask for public comments for the public comment policy. Do we have anyone wishing from the public or from the from the BAC wishes to make any kind of Short, brief statement. Paul. There you go. Hi, I'm Paul from Buxton. Sorry, I had to make sure I said it right. Um, my only comment is just an article that I recently read. I'm still doing verifying a couple of the information, but it kind of resides back to what I said a couple of weeks ago in this meeting where I have a sense where parents – goals for their kids is a little bit different than what the state has to do it. Um, there was just a recent article from a comment that the Maine's chief education said. Uh, I'm not going to say the quote because again, I'm, I, I haven't gotten enough to deep into it, but it's more, the basic fact is that we're, they're putting academic, like math, uh, English and writing behind seat of a different topic. Um, that just wanted to bring it aware to here because that also makes um, that also leads to another article talking about Maine losing funding from the federal government due to lack of uh, test scores. So just wanted to bring that so we can make sure that upcoming to our decisions, we're really focusing on meeting the standards of the state so we don't lose funding and we continue to give the kids the best education possible in the standard of reading, writing, or arithmetic for the future. Any other public comments? Mr. Burns. Thank you. Um, I, like you, I've never seen, and I've been doing this since its inception, uh, a list of uh, on, on this operational budget uh, with this many items. I wasn't going to waste my time going through item for item. I always feel and have stated in the past, um, I don't, I'm not in the proper position to tell uh, the district what their highest priorities are when it comes to this. Um, I, I expect that the administration uh, would figure out um, with their uh, staff uh, what's the most important thing to do with the money that they get. Now last year we had a long list of things that needed to be done and we came up with a number. This, when I saw this, I, 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 I thought, this is ridiculous, because to go through this list is just to waste everybody's time. Um, yes, you can make a case for everything that you need is important, but we only have so much money. I made a presentation to uh, the selectmen last night on camera so that it, hopefully it got out to everybody. I explained what was from the literature that we had so far, what we were for the baseline, what is now down here for the, uh, the, the uh, teacher part of it, teacher and programs. 
uh, and then I and also the debt, uh, and I also mentioned the number that um, was listed here for the operation, and um, it, it obviously people just shook their heads, and it's like, you know, this is ridiculous. You got to pick a number. Last year we ended up picking a number for each side, each uh, uh, of the supplementals, and we voted on it, and that's where we went forward with it. Um, and I would expect we, us to pick a number for the operational side and then leave it up to the administration to decide what they want, what is the most important, because this is just a joke to ask and put down $33 million. We understand that there's a lot of things that need to be done. And when I mention this number to one selectman, he says, oh, yeah, well, they're, they're going to get a new school. They're, they're looking for a new school. Well, yeah, but we're not going to pay for the new school uh, with tax money for the towns, and that's ridiculous. So um, I don't want to waste a lot of time, because time is of the essence trying to get this budget done. I don't want to waste a lot of time going over what each of us individually think is the most important items on the operational side. It's a waste of everybody's time. It, that should be up to the administration. I think we need to concentrate on, a, on the dollar amount and move forward with the uh, budget that way. Thank you. Any other public comments? Ben. I just want to speak on a little bit of both uh, issues that were spoken to previously. <clears throat> um, so Maine Department of Education, you guys can all go and read what was stated by uh, the chief of uh, education in the state serving under Janet Mills and stating that social emotional learning and those dynamics are more important than statistical dynamics on testing when it comes to math proficiency um, science proficiency and uh, reading proficiency so I want to speak specifically about math proficiency in the state of Maine Maine is 26 roughly in the state, in the country, I apologize, um, in proficiency in mathematics. Uh, you compare that with Nebraska, Kansas, and states that are very similar to Maine demographically, which are in the top five. Um, and they've implemented math programs that are exceptional. And I can provide that information to Clay Gleason and to Lori Napolitano. I really think that it's important to teach students emotional dysregulation control, uh, issues and emotional control and teach them the importance of having critical conversations without being emotional. That's a part of social emotional learning. But I think there are problems within social emotional learning that I diametrically am opposed to. <clears throat> um, on a further note, uh, the spending that has been outlined, I agree with Peter here, um, no other school board has a similar structure such as SAD 6 district in terms of a budget advisory committee. I think this is a circus to be honest. Um, I think that our operations as a budget advisory committee um, really is led and guided by individuals from the administrative state um, of MSAD 6 and these are really decisions that should be made by people we elect. Uh, people who serve on the school board, school board and are our voice and um, why are we one of I think two in the whole entire state that have a budget advisory committee and nobody else has adopted this brilliant idea of a budget advisory committee uh, that we have. Any other public comments? All right. Seeing none, in a sense, we have uh, gone over the, basically the uh, rules for public comments, the ground rules and norms. Uh, on page six, we have the minutes of the previous meeting, cases that the chair will entertain a motion to uh, proceed. Erica? Motion to approve as presented. Do we have a second? Mr. Burns or? All right. All those in favor, raise your hand. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, the business office did include the uh, New page of the ED 279 and page number 14. That's the one with the addition that they had talked about. Um, number seven, any questions from the previous meetings? Realize that we, if we didn't stray into it, don't, you know, 
go ahead. I love the endings of books, but like you know, the case is that we we got up to the first first part of the supplemental request. So the case is that any real critical questions from that page, which by the way um, was page 41 of last week's meeting, and it is now I got to get my my thing over there translationally. But the case is that any questions from the previous meeting? If not, I'm going to send it back to uh, Mr. Brockman to complete the revised supplemental and instructional budget. All right, moving right along. Mr. Brockman, Thank so you. we're moving on to page 42, so to speak. Well, first I'd like to go through uh, the revisions of the baseline budget so you know where okay. that part of it stands. And Oh, yeah, uh, sorry, 2.0. We're in revision 2.0. Page 28. Page 16 of your packet is where the baseline budget started, which was a 2.83% increase in the gross budget and a 6.32% increase in the uh, baseline. Then we moved on to revision one where I went through and made some changes, the ones that I could, uh, I felt that we were able to survive if we didn't have uh, a little over 600,000, which brought the budget increase for the baseline down to 2.15 in the tax increase to 3.42 that's on page 17 then the next uh, five pages gives you the detail of each of the categories and where the reductions were made we don't need to go through that in detail. If you have any questions, you can ask them. Uh, on page 2023, 20, we have the, the state valuations for the last two budget years and the percentages that uh, each of the towns pays for the, their share of the local assessment. You can see some towns went up, some towns went down. The average increase for all five towns was 6.72%. The fact that some went up and some went down will make uh, a change in their uh, shares of the total assessment. On page 18, uh, page 24 of the, this is of the initial draft and it gives you what each of the town's share increase was based on the six point 32% increase in taxes and you can see that they, the shares of the towns ranged from a high of 9.12% to a low of 5.84% based on the initial draft. But on the next page, 25, the 3.42% increase, which was revision one. You can see that the low was uh, 2.95 and the high was 6.15% for the general fund budget. Then I, I worked on it a little bit more then on page 28, you have the baseline budget revision 2, 
where we are right now. On page 28, you can see that the increase in the general fund budget is 2%, and the increase in the tax rates is 3.12%, which is uh, probably, as far as the baseline revision 2 goes, that's pretty much the bottom line. I don't know that we can uh, do much else to get that much lower. Then un under revision 2, the next five pages shows the detail of where the revisions were made. And then on page 34, it shows you the percentage increase in each of the town's local tax. And based on revision 2, the increase bottom line on taxation is 3.12 and the towns range from a low of 2.65 to a high of 5.84 there were three towns that were under three on uh, that revision so when we go on to page uh, 36, we're getting into the supplemental requests. And we first look at the instructional requests last week. Uh, page 36 is a list of what was approved in last year's budget. And the amount was uh, 999-164-61. And then on page 37 is the first revision of the supplemental instructional budget. The amount requested was 861666 and that was the amount that we looked at uh, last year, last week, and uh, Clay went over that and explained what each of the requests were and offered to make reductions of 250000 in that area, which brought the total supplemental instructional requests down to 611, 666. So that really is where we ended last meeting. We didn't get into uh, any of the capital requests, operational or debt service. So we will begin at that point and we'll start looking at uh, what is on the list for supplemental budget requests, capital and operational. It's not that we expect the BAC to provide uh, the priority ranking of all these requests. The purpose of showing you the requests is so that you understand that we have a significant issue here. There are a lot of things that need to be done. This 33 million is a snapshot of what we really need to do over the next 10 years. This is only those things that are most immediate there's not a chance that we can do them all, but you need to know what is out there, what is pending, why we're doing uh, this study that we are undertaking 
to be able to really identify where we need to put our money and how we're going to get the money to do this, hopefully, because we certainly can't add it to the budget. If you look at page 43, you can see that if we were to approve the baseline and everything, we've already cut 250000 out of instructional. We haven't looked at capital or new debt yet, but if you add into the budget the total amount that's listed in this packet, you can see that the increase in the operating budget plus the capital expenditures would be a 62.82% increase. And the increase in the tax rate would be 109.55%. Obviously, that isn't something that in, in any stretch of the imagination we could entertain. The reason that it's listed is so that you have an idea of what we're facing, what we're going to have to deal with one way or another over the next 10 years or longer. I just wanted you to be able to have a good understanding of what is out there, what we're going to have to deal with, and that we're going to need some kind of a mechanism to fund this, hopefully through the uh, long-range planning process that we're going through. We're going to get some ideas on what we have to do and how we're going to do it. Hopefully, a lot can be accomplished with state funding if we can present to the state an application when they open applications again next year probably so that we can get awarded state funding for either renovations or a, a new school. We'll find out as we go through the process just uh, what we might qualify for. What I want to do with this list is not look for you to tell us what we should do first or second or 45th. Is that I want you to be able to have an understanding of the kind of things that Adam will be facing in the next forever as long as we exist because we'll never catch up completely. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Adam. He'll go through the list quickly and just mention the kind of things on page 45 and beyond that we will be faced with having to deal with how to, how to get them done and how to pay for them. Adam? Adam, as I said before, uh, one of the questions I brought was that if you could briefly just go over how we came up with some of these estimates. I know how, but not everyone in the room understands how we came up with some of these numbers. All right, so based on the opening remarks today. I don't know if I should change my delivery of this information. I'm going to look to the chair to tell me how you'd like to hear this. Well, might as well just go straight at it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I want to start by saying this list is not generated solely by me. This is um, in combination uh, with me meeting with all the different administrators at each of the schools which also includes athletic directors, um, Lenny Holmes from TLC, Adult Ed, and the Technology Department. So it's a list that's um, a combination of me meeting with all these individuals and comprehensively putting it together. 
You will see some major big ticket items on this list, yes. They're huge. Um, as we go through the process of the master plan, a lot of those items are going to get developed through the master plan process. So yeah, they live on a list today, and that may be the need of the school in the moment. And yeah, is it a need of the school in the future? Sure. Will they come off this list today? Likely. But Bill was right. This is the needs of the district, right? And it shows a $33 million situation. It's not all inclusive either. We did a facility condition assessment last year that suggested we had approximately $36 million situation. Approximately 20% of what you see on this list lives on that list. So technically, we have close to a 50 to $60 million deferred maintenance problem. So if you want to run the numbers a little further, go ahead, but at the end of the day, your taxes would essentially triple if we dealt with the current problem. So just wanted to preface the, the list by saying that. So you, like you said, you see a list, seven pages. I'm going to go as quick as I can. I guess I'd ask that we wait till the end if you have questions so I can at least get through this because if we don't, we're going to be here forever or we'll carry this into the next meeting. Is that fair for everybody? And we're going to start by a question right off. What do we got? Uh, as you go through the list, could you, in your personal professional position, like, hey, like, give me an asterisk. I think, like, priority-wise, if you if you had to set this in order, like, hey, I think X, I would like to focus on that, and that way we can notate it, whatever, on your um So the list is already created in such a fashion that you see the first column on the left. There's a number there, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That is the list of priorities, one being the top priority, two being the bottom. So that's already priority has already been established. Right, but you can also then look at the priority one of the multiple and be like, I think of the ones, this is the one that we need to focus on. That's that's what I'm saying. Because I understand there's priority, but there's a, an, an also a multitude of ones, but there should be a higher priority of ones, correct? Absolutely. And I don't know that I would be in a position to relay that data today because I don't think we're going to have that time. But my suggestion would be at the next meeting, we're going to look at this list again, and the list is going to look way different. It's going to be knocked down to a more palatable number that we can actually entertain as a BAC group. So, yes, there are priority ones that stand up above other priority ones, but the list next week in your packet will illustrate that. So that information will definitely be delivered. It just won't come today. I don't know that we'll have the time. Maybe if we do, we will. Um, but definitely next week. Uh, you'll see that list whittled down to a more palatable number comparable to what we did last year. Sorry, I'm not good at talking in microphones. <laughs> Thank you. Usually my voice carries plenty. All right. Bonnie Eagle High School, first item. Greg Apple, senior principal over there, asked for renovations to the administrative offices. You see a description on the right. I'm not going to read every one of those, but I'll at least hit on the actual line item, and then you can read the descriptor. Again, $1.2 million renovation. Um, unlikely that we would handle that, but that's something that would get ferreted out through the uh, master plan process. Sorry, Mr. Chair, you asked a question. Um, can you repeat that? I want to answer your question. Um, my question was, sorry, there was one, the understanding of the abbreviations, the numbers at the first of the column. The okay. secondary thing was the fact is that from an estimate process, what, some of the questions that came up was, yep. When we determined uh, window and entrance exit door coverings for 10,000, I've told several people here that our facilities department has both internal people as well as external people that have more than enough experience to come up with these numbers. Some of the numbers are based solely on the fact that we're going to do the work internally ourselves, so it's more of equipment cost than it is a labor cost. So the understanding, as I said, was just briefly to, you know, because I've said here over the number of years is, understanding how we come up with some of these estimates just so that, you know, not, let's say, delve into it, but just understand for everyone here, you know, when something says 20,000, that's a pretty solid number historically. Yeah, so to Mr. Delaney's question, these numbers are based on my 26 years of experience in doing this as an being an architecture and engineering firm, being a contractor, and being a facilities director at multiple institutions. The numbers are not necessarily 100% accurate. They are estimates. There is no estimate under the sun that is going to be 100% accurate until you get a quote. Some of these are quotes. You will see that, like in line towards, 
towards the bottom, VHS parking lot crack bill, $75,000. That's a real quote. I got that from a vendor. Granted, that quote's old. It would have to be revisited. But those, So you will see that as you go through the descriptors that some of these are, in fact, quotes. But for the most part, they are based on experience in doing this work. And not just by me, by some of my staff and some of the professionals we hire on a regular basis. Does that answer your question? Okay. Next item, five classrooms, three office edition. Again, this is requested by the principal at the high school. Um, roughly estimated at seven and a half million dollars. Understandable, it's a big, big ticket item. If you look at the notes column in the far right, that'll be evaluated during the master plan process. Window and, window and entrance exit door coverings. Again, request of the high school, but this actually goes into um, student and staff safety and active shooter type situations. And so that's an item that likely will stay on this list. Emergency backpacks, all classrooms, again, asked of the principal. I'm not gonna sit here and say I know the requirements of my emergency backpacks, but he asked for it, so there must be a thing. I will evaluate whether that should move forward or not. Exercise room addition at the high school, definitely needed. If you guys have been there, you would know. Um, again, to make something of nothing, it's gonna take quite a bit, two and a half million dollars. Again, evaluated through the master plan process. Student bathroom renovations, huge one in our district. For those of you who were here last year, we talked about that a lot. We did a ton of work last summer renovating bathrooms. I continue to do work in renovating bathrooms and we need to keep that going. And so that money is to help continue to upgrade our bathrooms in our and the high school, in this case, the high school. Classroom and corridor painting goes without saying, right? Dings and dents, scratches, we got it everywhere. Classroom and corridor painting could probably happen every other year just to keep up with the standard. RTU replacement, athletics, advising, and nursing. This is a unit that takes on tons of water when it rains. It's way past its useful life needs to be replaced or we're gonna to continue to see further deterioration of its surroundings. Interior lighting upgrades, low hanging fruit, to go to LED, fairly short money, and we get incentives from Efficiency Main, kind of a no brainer, and it saves us piles of money and energy after we're done. Parking lot crack fill, seal stripe. Most of you guys don't see our parking lots in the summer Many of you probably do, I don't know. But if you look at the cracks, those cracks start to have growth, grass, weeds, everything starts to grow up through. Eventually it becomes to the point where the deterioration is so bad that you have massive potholes that the buses, parents, teachers are falling in and having to contend with. This is an upkeep activity so that we don't run into those future issues. Again, this, is, this one is a quote, $75,000 to do the lots at the high school. And that's three quotes I got for that, by the way, and that was the low. Gym floor repairs, our buildings are our community centers. They get a lot of traction, a lot of abuse. Um, so this is continual upkeep of our gym floors to keep them in somewhat of a, I don't want to call it pristine, but a playable condition. That's the high school. I guess I will entertain that question at the high school once I go to the middle school. Anybody got a question about the high school? Sheriff office does not supplement the budget, so no, we have to bore in the cost of that. Yes. Correct. Every year, every, every year our gym floor should receive a screen and recoat. So there is going to be an ongoing expense annually to do so, yes. The major expense was done last year. We completely refinished the gym floors of the high school and the middle school at the tune of $25,000 a pop. 
So this is to, to continue with that upkeep so that the floors don't deteriorate to a point where we got to spend another $26,000 to bring it back to a playable condition. Yeah, just one more. Uh, so should we count that 8000 as a reoccurring cost then every year for 8000 Uh, No. This year there's going to be a little bit more repairs just due to the fact that the finish is fresh from last year and it incurred a little more damages because they didn't have 30 layers of finish and only had three. Right, so if, if we so do this it this year, year for gonna, eight, what's next year going to be two? I can't answer that. The market's going to dictate that. So when we sit at the table next year, we'll have that discussion based on the market value. Oh. Okay, I'm yeah, just roughly two to three thousand dollars. Because if it's a recurring one, it'll go to our reoccurring cost. It won't. Okay, just double checking. It's a good question. Just want to make sure. All right, middle school window replacement. Some of those windows are original to that facility, um, and are deteriorating really bad. We actually have plywood over some broken glass. We have frames that have rotted. You can put your finger right through the inside. The joke is it snows on the inside in some locations. So. That kind of goes without saying. Needs, they need to be replaced. Middle school bathroom upgrades. I already touched on that at the high school. Just continued repairs to our bathrooms till we get them up to some sort of current standard. Next page, 46. Middle school roof replacement. Of the, of the schools that we have in our district, the middle school probably needs the most roof work. If you add up all the value of the so we did a study last year. We hired uh, IRS. Um, they came in and did a study. If you add up all the value of what needs to replace, it adds up to $2.2 million. Now, I just, just today got estimates to tackle certain roofs on that building to the tune of approximately 350000 So. This one will likely get knocked from 2.2 to, down to 350, or maybe even less, depending on uh, what the, the BAC can can take on. Flooring replacement. This is a request from the principal there, Mr. Hand. Um, he asked to have the carpet replaced in the office. That's one that potentially may not live on the list at next week's meeting. Not sure yet. There is carpet in there. It's not horrible, but it's not the best either. It was a request from him, so I just put it on the list. Flooring replacement in the corridors. Some of those floors are original to the school. As you can imagine, buildings move. It sounds weird, but it does happen. So the floors are seeing some awkward movement and to the point where the surface is actually starting to deteriorate. So this $45,000 was to do one long corridor um, in that school to bring that up to some sort of standard collector shop area so the shop area at the middle school the activity there has seems to have incre increased based on what I've heard from past doings over there and they use the wood shop way more often we've actually dumped the existing collector three times this season when we only did it once last year the existing system is not adequate for the tools that they are you that the kids are using in there today so they are limited as to which tools they can use in the moment. This price is an actual quote to replace that system with a brand new state-of-the-art dust collection system to replace the what is original to the building dust collector. Fuel conversion to propane. Propane is our largest utility, um, especially when it comes to our fuels. We get the best rate for propane so it's advantageous for the district to look and to do as many conversion to propane projects as possible to reduce the amount of money that we're spending on that utility, on, on heating oil, essentially. Right now we're burning number two oil at the middle school. We consume a lot of number two oil at a much higher rate, almost double propane. Um, we actually have quotes from pit stop, from site contractors to do that work. The price that you see there is the, the combination of all those different quotes put together to convert that to propane. Emergency generator replacement. Oh, I forgot to mention too, the existing oil tank there failed inspection. We are on a waiver from the state to maintain that through June. We have to do it. We have no choice. The next one is kind of tied to that emergency generator. The reason why we failed is because the generator lives on the same line as the boiler. You cannot do that by code. And so we will need to now replace the generator that current, 
currently burns a number two oil to propane. And that is the emergency evacuation shelter for our district. And so it makes sense to have the entire building backed up and that price reflects a generator that costs the price to back up the entire facility. Uh, where were they? Pell Pelletier Barn is what they call a Pathfinder Barn. Lives right adjacent to the middle school for use of those that don't know. The, that is starting to see age. The trim, the doors, the frames, everything is rotting really badly. It is the face of our district when the visitors come to a football game. So the first thing they see is a deteriorated barn as they make their way over to the stands. Um, I don't know that I need to say any more about that. Interior lighting upgrades, again, same as the high school, conversion to LED from what is now either fluorescence or incandescence. Low hanging fruit, huge money saver after we implement this project. Again, park, parking lot crack fill seal, that's just to maintain what we currently have to prevent further deterioration. Stage at the elevator replacement. Existing stage, uh, existing stage elevator is obsolete. It recently failed and parts cannot be found. So we're faced with having to completely replace that and that is a quote from Otis Elevator to replace it for $30,000. That's the middle school. Any questions about the middle school? Down here, Mr. Blyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, Adam, so on um, the generator, you're saying that the, the oil tank mm -hmm. failed because it feeds the boiler and the generator at the same time. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Could those oil tanks be separated? Mm -hmm. The oil tank is a 30,000 gallon tank that lives underground. If you can find a great way to separate that, I'm all ears. Could we just put a home heating barrel there that carries 275 gallons? How often does a generator operate? Generator operates for 15 minutes every week on a schedule, I think it's Thursday morning, and that's the exercise itself regularly, and then it operates when there's a failure. So you gen emergency generator needs to supply fuel that has a 24-hour runtime. 250 gallons is not nearly enough for that. Mr. Blair's question, Adam, if, if we got something like a secondary tank in addition to the current oil tank, let's say 3,000 gallons in, in addition to the one we have, what kind of, you know, costs or what kind of expectation, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to look at the actual size to get the 24-hour runtime, determine what size that would be based on the generator we'd have, determine the size of the tank, find a location for that tank, run the numbers and see if it logistically makes sense. 30,000 gallon, I mean a 3,000 gallon tank, there is no home for that there, unfortunately. We're strapped to get 4,000 gallons worth of propane in that location. So, yeah. yes, we, I actually have looked at that just to see if it makes sense to put a secondary tank to feed that generator. The other thing to note about the generator, it's original. Yeah, it's ancient. It could fail tomorrow. It's way past its useful and service life, right? So and it is our emergency shelter. So yeah, I can provide another fuel, but that doesn't mean that I fixed an aging piece of equipment. If we convert to propane, we replace the generator to a propane-fired generator, and it, the issue goes away, right? We, we meet, the oil tank gets removed, we pacify the letter of the DEP, and we are now burning propane to heat the school and supply the emergency generator. Yeah, which is in the notes, it says new generator to operate on propane on our... Buxton's, oh, sorry. One more question. Yeah, sorry. The only question I have, when was the middle school built? Because I know I graduated 75 from there, but 60, does anybody that? know? 65, 60? The original building, yeah. the middle school was? The, 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 when it was the high school. And it's seen okay. three, two, two major additions, I believe, yeah. since then. So around, yeah. It was, you did double sessions for four years. I did that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know all about it. I do. Okay, thank you. It's an old generator, sorry. All right, uh, Buxton Center Elementary. Met with Mr. Pendleton over there. Um, first item is install an accessible ramp at door nine. That's a door 
Craig help, help me with these, but uh, you can see the description there, but that's essentially to get the physically challenged individuals out of the building safely. Yeah, this the, like it's the door that connects with our functional life skills students. Uh, if you were to go out the door, the students that are in wheelchairs or, um, or need assistance walking um, have to step down. There's no, and that's also where they go out for recess um, and it's, it's a, their emergency exit if there's a fire or fire drill. Thank you, sir. Uh, next item, light fixture in the sidewalk to light the flag uh, at some point in history. So there's lights in the ground over there. They're actually in the sidewalk. The one that got damaged, this was to replace the one that got damaged. There is an alternative to that. That one likely will come off the list. Um, it's a matter of just taking the flag down every night, honestly. Uh, re number three, repair brick at the window lintels. So last year we had a request for a similar amount of money. This is again the same request of fifty thousand dollars that the lintels. Uh, oh, let, me, let me start over. The supports at the top of the windows is failing. The bricks are starting to fail, and water is starting to intrude or infiltrate the building, which is causing further deterioration. This money is to support repairing the brick, so that we don't get any more infiltra infiltration. Cafeteria floor upgrades, that, car that school was built with a carpet cafeteria. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Getting a mustard stain of a dark blue carpet is not the easiest thing. Uh, syrup is another one that's awful. But anyway, this would be to remove all that carpet and put in either an epoxy or a solid surface material that makes it way easier to clean with much less maintenance. This is one that's questionable as to whether it remains on the list or not. Um, because it does function today. It's not ideal, but it does function. So it, I don't know, I'm gonna contemplate this one. Uh, next page, interior lighting upgrades, similar to high school, middle school, low hanging fruit. We should upgrade the LED where we can. Um, so that's an item there on that list to take care of Box and Center. Box and Center list is fairly short, mostly because the school is relatively new. And your principal is, is pretty practical. So, any questions about Box and Center? I just Sorry, have, Izzy, first. We'll do with Ben. Yeah. I ben, you have, go first. I just have two questions. Number one, uh, Adam, how old is uh, Buxton, uh, Buxton Center Elementary School? 2011. Okay. And um, I, think, I think it might actually be three questions, so it's my apologies. The next one is... Um, are you aware of who the contractor was on the brickwork uh, specifically regarding the window? Um, I don't know the specific contractor that did the masonry, although we can obviously look it up. Davis okay. and Hanscom was the general contractor, correct? Hanscom was? Hanscom was the GC. Okay. That was a sub a subcontractor to Davis and Hanscom. I have to look up to determine okay. who that is. Okay, last question who, uh, for you, Adam. Do you, are you aware of who the architecture for the project was? Yeah, Harriman. Harriman. Her, what was it? Harriman. Thank you. H a r r i m a n. Okay. Izzy. Um, regarding the accessible, the accessible ramp, um, where's the ADA compliance that it isn't there now? I guess. So the building is, has, is accessible. Okay. Just not at that location. So this is this is an additional. So like, if you go through the front door at Box and Center, you could wheel a chair in without any problem. Right? Okay. So the accommodation is being provided at the school, just not specific to this location. And I'm sh probably over time programming in the building has changed. Correct. That's what I was going to say. So push people to that side of the building. When so, when the so when the school first opened, there they were the, oh, that group of students was at a different location. Um, and I, actually, I probably, on my guess is that when that moved down to that wing, didn't even think about that door. Um, but now that, or nine. now Sorry. that we're there, you don't know we have that to. Okay, thank you. So this is, this is an additional egress. Yeah, yes, it would create an additional accessible egress, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, uh, Adam, thank you. Um, quick question. Um, all the lighting upgrade, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I think it's a good move. Uh, but Efficiency Bain is going to give us rebates. Now, you've got to probably look, looking through the roughly about uh, $200,000 worth of light replacements. Yep. Does that include the rebates that we'll get from uh, Efficiency Bain? No, it doesn't. None of, this is, none of that's a guarantee. Uh, 
that if efficiency main looked at me and said, I'm going to guarantee you $200,000, go replace your lights, I would, that number would not be 45000 Well, you know, there's no guarantee, but there so will. I have, I have to assume that I'm not going to get that money, right? So I have to budget appropriately. If, again, if the state, if efficiency main came and said, I'm going to guarantee you this money, then that number would come down. Okay, so then let me ask a question differently. Are you going to apply for efficiency main? Absolutely. And how much money do you expect to get re reimbursed on efficiency main on these prod on the, on these light items? I can't measure that because the prescriptive measures that come from efficiency main change over the course of the year and change from year to year. So today's incentive is going to be different than when I try to deploy this in July, and it's going to be different than next year. So I wish I could answer your question. But I really I can't because it's going to be different tomorrow. It's going to be different next year. Other districts complain costs. So I could guess, but I don't know. I don't know that the group wants to hear a guess, and nor am I willing to give a guess. I'm not going to go on record with a guess. I'm just not doing it. Uh, it. If you look at an efficiency main incentives, there's a whole list of stuff that you can apply for, right? So it's a matter we have to look at. Am I replacing the entire fixture, or am I replacing just the lamp? And the incentive is different, depending on what we plan to do. So every instance is going to be a little different. In the cases that we've, in the schools that we've already done, HB Emory, for example, we did a full light lamp replacement only. Those bulbs were less than a dollar a piece after incentive, being purchased through our vendor. So that was a no-brainer. It went from seven dollars a pop to less than a dollar. Right? So just that kind of gives you some sense of magnitude what we would look at if we just did a lamp replacement. When I was at university, we did fixture replacements there. The incentive at the time was a full replacement. So they bought the fixture, we paid for the labor. So in the sense, we got a free fixture out of it for the time it took to replace it. So I, I, I wish I could put my finger on it. And I, it it's just so fluid and it's dependent on what you're dealing with in the moment in that situation. Like great, great question. Any que other questions? All right, moving on right along. Ed. All right, where were we, Edna? Yeah, Edna, Edna Libby. Libby. EDL. Um, okay, room painting and door painting kind of goes without saying. That school hasn't seen a, a facelift paint job in quite a while. Um, definitely necessary. Carpet in the main office is a teacher's room, something the principal asked for. That carpet is in pretty rough shape. It's actually lifting from the concrete, um, and it's getting to be the point where it's starting to be a tripping hazard, actually. That's something that I really would like to get done in the summer. Um, and we're sitting on quite a bit of product already from past projects that just didn't get installed, whether it was overstock or whatever it is. So I suspect I'm going to have enough product in-house to complete that job, which in turn would bring that cost down. Carpet in the pre-K room, same story. Paving and striping. Um, COVID, I think, pushed a lot of parent drop-off. Lighting, parent drop-off went up considerably during COVID. And so there's a lot more traffic going through that section of that school these days. And there used to be a small island in that parking lot where parent drop off is. That went away, but it never got paved. So it's, as, it's dirt. Um, so every time we get there with a plow, parents driving over it continuously in bad weather, you can potholes form, right? So this paving and striping would be to take care of those issues that we have at Edna Libby, Libby regarding the asphalt that's missing. As you can guess, asphalt is not cheap. It's a, it's a petroleum based product. So. It's relatively expensive just to do a little bit of paving these days. Refinish the gym floor. And Olivia's gym floor hasn't been sanded or refinished. I don't know that anybody here could even tell us. It may not have ever been done. And it's in need. It's the next one probably on the list with Georgie Jack that is going to need a full-on sand and reco refinish. So you see that $35,000 price. I mentioned earlier $26,000 last year. I added some escalation costs. The last year's price based on the market to get it to 35 grand and that would be to sand it down to bare wood repaint all the lines and refinish it and interior lighting upgrades same story as previous any 
questions about Edna? Any, any questions about Edna Libby? As I said, I apologize. The, uh, we'll try to get a directory of what the abbreviations are just so in case. And, and the answer to the gym floor question is um, it was a couple years before Annie got there in pre-kindergarten, so that's a good 18 years ago, 19 years ago. Oh, wow. Well, right. Yeah, that that's how long ago. I remember. All right. Georgie Jack. Yeah. Classroom painting. So last year we did painting in the corridors and all the door frames, so all the public facing spaces got painted. This would be painting of the interior of the classrooms to kind of finish off that job. Rear deck stair replacement. The current rear deck that takes you out to the playground from the upper gym area, it does not meet code. Um, the rise and, draw, uh, rise and run of all the stairs currently do not meet code. They are safe to use, but they don't meet code. So this $15,000 would be um, to replace that stair and deck. Replace the water service. A few years ago, I don't remember what year it was, there was a failure of the water line out in front of the school. So a section of that water line got replaced, but only a section. So this money would be to replace the remainder to the street to prevent a further blowout of the water line so we don't have to lose school. Georgie Jack, finish, refinish, gym floor. Same comments as Edna Libby. I think that gym floor is even older. It's the oldest school we have, so it's in really bad shape. But it gets a ton of use, right? The community uses it a lot. So $35,000, again, sand, restripe, and recoat. And interior lighting upgrades, broken record, but same idea there, go from fluorescence and get descents LED. Any questions about Georgie Jack? Seeing none, moving along to Hollis Elementary. Hollis Elementary. We did a lot of work there last summer using SRF funding, but there's still plenty more to do. Cafeteria floor replacement. I was hopeful to do it the next last year, but it didn't work out. But this would be to replace the, the solid surface floor that's in there. It's starting to fail the tiles are popping cracking um, this would be to totally redo that floor with a new solid surface material gymnasium mechanical upgrades you guys are all familiar with the gym over there the old quonset hut down below yeah so the, the unit there is original we actually spent time there just this week because the unit tripped out on plane failure it's old it takes in snow the snow drifts horribly there it trips out regularly way past its useful life and it needs to be replaced. So the $65,000 would be a direct replacement of that unit. Classroom painting, again, goes without saying. We At Paulus last summer, we painted a lot, though. We did all, again, public facing spaces, so corridors, the admin area, the office suite, those all got painted, but none of the interior of the classrooms got done. So this number would be to paint the interior as far as that number will take us. Interior lighting upgrades, again, like I mentioned earlier. Room number signage. Um, this would be to actually number each room, provide the appropriate sign that has the number and braille for the visually impaired at each of the locations so that people know where they're going. She's pointing at me. No, I can't tell. So I, I'm actually glad you asked that because last summer we painted just the outfacing corridors of the, of the new wing in the administrative area, 18 grand. Oh. Room number signage, sorry. So, it, uh, well, what do I got out there? Room number signage, $25,000. How elaborate do you want to get? We can be real simple, put a room number, put Braille, $2 a piece. We can do it real cheap. Or do we, does the district want to set a standard that we carry across all of our elementary schools for a certain look, a certain image, certain branding that we want to put out there? I don't know the answer to that. So again, I have to put a number to something, and yeah, it's likely high, and I can cut that back considerably. Um, and we can do a well, minimal amount to accomplish what we're looking to accomplish. So I'm going to make a note of that. 
Thank you, Adam. I'm just I'm not familiar with how much it would it how much work it would be and what it would entail. So that was yeah. my that was that was my my raised eyebrow. Yeah, Thank no, you for this, explaining it. In this case, it. we'd have to hire a sign vendor that is that can put together these signs and actually apply the braille. It's kind of a, it's a process. Um, but like Welch signs or Rising Revolution out of Shapley, we would call a vendor in, give them all our room numbers, give them the image that we're looking for, the colors, and they would develop them all, come bring them to the site, and we could either install them or have them install them. Thank you. Questions about house? Um, Adam, I have a question regarding, um, and you may not know this, maybe Clay does or Lori. So long-term aspirations, a part of our comprehensive planning has to do with consolidation. And specifically my interest in Hollis Elementary is the plot of land that it sits on, which has been in the past discussed as a option for expansion and uh, further uh, HB Emory School, which I think is one of the, is HB Emory, HB Emory is in Limington, my apologies. Correct. And um, consolidating Limington schools into the parcel of Hollis. <clears throat> is that something that is a part of your discussions in terms of consolidation of Limington, uh, HB Emory into Hollis, or is it the other way around? Or where do you guys stand on that comprehensive planning for the long term? It's a good question. It's really early to to say anything definitively. That's part part of what we're doing, engaging Harriman in this um, master planning, facilities planning, long range planning committee. It's to see what, um, there's, there's several parts to that. One is what does the community want, right? Because whatever I think might need, not match what those communities can support. Um, the costs of doing those things and how it, how it might um, change depending on what the scope of the project is. So that's what Harriman's supposed to help us you know, what does it look like if we do nothing? What does it look like if we consolidate in different places? What if we, you know, renovate our existing facility? So it is it is part of that then, I guess I'd say, part of that process. The last, the follow-up question is quick. In terms of the parcel and, um, you know, obviously with uh, consolidation comes density, you know, in the building and those dynamics. The parcel of HB Emory, and I haven't looked at it, we're not on um, HB Emory, this is Hollis. Yes, yes, I apologize. But we're talking about consolidation long term, and both of them have an effect. What we spend on uh, HB Emory may be Just one wasted. point here. We own land. Sorry, the school board yeah. acquired land in adjacent to the Hollis Elementary there School. There you go. Thank so the you. point is that, sorry, the case is that, for those of you who don't remember, years ago, Deb and I were there. We acquired a large chunk of land adjacent to the Hollis Elementary School. So the case is that, uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, I, if Becky Bally was here, we'd have laughed because I think we we flipped a coin over who got the plans for Hollis Elementary that was rejected by the voters. It was at the old Buxton High School when we tore it down. The reality is is that um, from a land standpoint, we still, in a sense, have a sizable chunk of land uh, in adjacent to the Hollis Elementary School. Thank you for that, Todd. That answers yeah. kind of my questions Sorry, regarding Claire. expansion. No big deal. Yeah. No, but it's so to say, HB Emory is the opposite of that situation, unfortunately. Mary? I'm going to be asked this tomorrow morning um, what the plan is with the problem with the pickup and drop off of students. At Hollis? Right. Elementary, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that it is a problem at Hollis. It's also a problem at Edna Libby. It's also a problem at HB Emory. And it goes back to what Mr. Um, Thibodeau said about the shift, two, two parts, the shift in habits since COVID, there's a lot more people transporting and some of the challenges we have transporting kids. Like that's part of it. We we are daily canceling a couple of bus runs, which forces people to transport. So I don't have an answer for you tonight, Mary. There's, um, we've looked into it, uh, as you as you know, and it's, it's a fairly ex, um, expensive option because of all the permitting and, and all the requirements being right off Route 35. Uh, but I will tell you this, that it will be part of any planning that we do on that site because I, I I've lived through it as you know and it is not good it's not good the difference in Hollis is that we have the town hall office as a neighbor whereas at um in Edna Libby it just it clogs up a major state road but there's not a and town a office across the street right and Georgie Jacket blocks the intersection of 25 and 35 right so we have these these issues any other questions about Hollis Elementary 
All right. Deep Falls Deep Elementary. Falls. Uh, only a couple items here being one of the, I guess, potential sites for consolidation. So kind of tightened up the scope there a little bit. Uh, playground inspection and repairs. The playground over there is aged. It's still of wooden nature. It's not up to current standard at all. Um, so there's some significant needs there for playground. Um, I actually looked at the playground with Mr. Pendleton yesterday at Buxton Center, looking at some potential changes over there for their adaptive students. Did I get that right? Yeah. Um, so the potential of moving that existing playground at Buxton Center to Steep Falls is kind of on the table right now. Just looking at that option. To buy a new playground set, though, you might as well, the $5,000 won't even put a dent in that. Not even close. Um, interior lighting upgrades, again, goes without saying. There is plenty of work that we could do at Steve Falls, um, but it's questionable as to what the future holds for that, that, that facility. I'm sure the master planning process is going to be a Correct. quite a healthy conversation. HB Emory, any questions, Steve Falls? All right, HB Emory, um, the intercom system there is definitely on its last leg. We continue to babysit it when it fails. Um, that is an actual quote that we got from Canfield for $18,000 to do a full replacement of that system. But we're also looking at intercom systems district-wide um, as it relates to school safety and what the actual needs are so that we are in some sort of compliance with uh, appropriate school safety. So we're not looking at just the HB Emory right now, we're looking at all the schools um, just to make sure we have two-way communication between some head end location in each of the classrooms so that if there's a situation that the teacher in that classroom can, or the student can communicate back to some head end. But we are looking at that district wide. Just HB Emory has the current need. Um, the mulch, the weed mat on the hillside, this item was there last year. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that site. This is on a pretty fairly steep banking on the back of the school and there's a switchback road walkway that takes you down to the lower level. Kids use that banking for as well, they're kids, right? So they do what they do. So the the mulch, the weed mat takes a thrashing over the course of the year and it's just one of those things that just has to be kept up with. Painting corridors and classrooms again goes without saying we haven't done much painting in the corridors or classrooms there. We haven't done any since I've been here. Um, and I, I really don't know when the last time that was done, but there is definitely a need. Door hardware upgrades. Last year we did a project at Hollis to upgrade all the hardware. So this is tackling two different things. It's bringing the hardware up to an ADA standard so it makes them all accessible for everyone. But it also tackles a security concern Right now, every school is keyed differently on its own key system, and I am working towards a master key system for the entire district that eventually a single key will open every door at every school. Hollis was the start of that, but we built that off of what Buxton Center created. So Buxton Center is the start of that when it was built. We tagged on to its keying system. We did Hollis. Next would be HB Emory, and that's why it's on the list. Now that is a as close to an estimate as you're going to get based on what we did at Hollis to actually do that, uh, that door hardware upgrade. And that was identified through the facility condition assessment as a need based on accessibility. Uh, HB Emory, there is a one portable out there. Um, the principal of Charlotte Regan asked about possibly putting a bathroom in that portable. Challenging because the bathroom is actually at a lower elevation than the existing school. All right, so it's not just building a bathroom, but it's also getting the water to it and getting the sewage away from it. So that's why that price tag is considerably higher than you'd probably expect. That one likely will come off the list. And then again, room number signage, like we talked about at Hollis, that's the, at the uh, appropriate room number signage in Braille installed. Um, Adam, one of the things we always run into is uh, with HB Emory and some of the schools that are still using portables, 
Um, the cases that somebody asked me, it's not portable toilets we're talking about. This is a portable classroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the cases <laughs> that somebody goes, 250000 for a portable toilet? No, no, this is this is not a portable toilet. This is an adjunct or portable classroom, which, by the way, if when we get to the master planning, to Ben's point, which is a valid one, if we consolidate, we, you know, get rid of the portables, meaning, i.e., you know, try to get away from them as they are. The, from a certification standpoint is why we try to do at the high school was to get rid of them. You All right. Any other questions on HB Emory? You could take two zeros off that and put a couple of composting toilets. In yeah. There. A, yeah. I'm going to get yelled at. Pretty sure the parents aren't going to go for that. But that's, Thank you, Adam. I already got yelled at about 250,000 okay. portable toilets. Let's Fine. not go there. Mr. Carlo. Um, thank you, Adam. Can you provide any kind of insight as to how many students use those portables? And if instead of building a bathroom in the portable, what it would look like to get all those students in the, into the building? That's a great question. So, Clay, help me with this, but if I'm going based on averages, it's like 15 per class, there's two there. No? I, th I think that, uh, yeah, there are two fifth grades currently op occupying that. Last year there was one large fifth grade in there, and now there are two fifth grades, so 40 kids, 40 kids. 38 kids, okay. something like that. It, it right is now, a they point. leave the portable to come to the school to use the bathroom to the back, so it's... Yeah, Principal of, Regan and I have discovered, discussed a few different options of how, if she couldn't have this, which she recognizes, it's a, it's a long shot, of how she might organize things to try to improve that. Okay. So sounds like there is some conversation about bringing those into the school, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's a system-wide conversation on trying to get rid of the portables anyways, but I'm just curious. Thank you. Yeah, that's something we should probably look at opportunities to do that everywhere we have portables if we can. Well, certification, sorry, for those of you who don't understand why, why did we bring up the portables is years ago around the high school we used to have some in the back parking lot and the students would have to cross the parking lot to get to the portables. Um, and uh, when we had our high school certification process, uh, Ms. Black and I remember that one. Uh, I think there was literally the certification board was like, we're not certifying you because of the portables. So realize that sometimes when we talk about portable classrooms, they can be a lightning rod for some of these outside, serv outside providers who look at our district. Um, as also from a funding standpoint, realize that uh, if those of you don't understand, I spend a lot of time talking to other districts. Sanford and some of the other school districts that are on the list of when they get money from the state was because the number of portables they have in some of the states, or sorry, some of the, the you know, let's say percentage of classrooms and students that were in them. Any other questions about HP Emory? If not, we're moving on to the transportation department. We're getting tight on time. All right, um, transportation, a couple items there. Lobby floor um, is starting to deteriorate just because the flashing around the door wasn't done very well, so it's taken on water over time, so we have some rot there to deal with. Um, we have scoped it out. That is a fairly accurate number, five grand. And then to uh, upgrade the interior lighting to LED as well, to just kind of can carry carry that um, forward. Any questions about transportation? All right. Frank Seeing Jewett. Yeah, Frank Jewett. FJ's Frank Jewett. Um, I met with Lenny over there, and the replace of the cafeteria floor is definitely needed. The floor tiles are popping up all over the place in there. Um, they actually use it as a cafeteria and I'll call it a basketball court. Okay, we'll call it phys ed, phys ed. Um, and so the repetitive bouncing of a ball on that existing surface is causing it to fail, unfortunately. So we're going to look at a different product to go in there that they can use for phys ed and for a cafeteria function that will st stand up to the abuse. Uh, paint the exterior. That's the main entrance. That's one of the items that Lenny asked for. And he is right. It is peeling really, really bad, and it needs to be redone. Bathroom renovations, those bathrooms are original to school. Um, this was came up in the facility condition assessment as a need for accessible bathrooms. The renovated full on men's and women's bathroom of, of, of size like this is, is going to be expensive, so I got that around $140,000. Cafeteria tables, uh, something the administration asked for over there to provide four new cafeteria tables. They currently don't have any or don't have enough I'm not sure interior lighting upgrades same comments as earlier and electrical upgrades so again that building is fairly old 
Um, there is not a lot of receptacles in the wall to plug in devices. Educational philosophy seems to be to use a lot of technology these days. Um, so they're looking for um, ways that we can Im improve the electrical system in there so they can have more opportunities to plug in their devices. Any questions about Frank Jewett? Sorry, uh, since I Izzy then uh, Ben. This Izzy first. This Sorry. is just a comment. Mm -hmm. I went to the fifth and sixth grade at Frank Jew, what is now the Frank Jewett School, and if that's the original bathrooms, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yikes. Ben. <laughs> well, I was right. <laughs> They're bad. Thank you for your time. At <laughs> 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 Yeah. And for that, for the men in the room, the urinals go to the floor. When was the last time you saw one of those, right? So. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. They're really old. They're um, super old. <laughs> no problem. They're very old, <laughs> Izzy. <laughs> I would say antique. Uh, they'll be in like the, the Smithsonian. It's wow. Look at this. <laughs> yes. Ben, go ahead. Ben, you got a so, question. Um, so in terms of operational use of Frank Jewett, um, which uh, sits aside um, Buxton Center Elementary School, if I'm correct. Correct. Um, what is the utilization of the space, and um, can you see, in terms of the long term, it being consolidated into Buxton Center Elementary School? Um, no, sorry. But, but on, to your point, there are two, two programs that are high school programs, but I will say that I would be interested in looking at that being a, a site that if there was a consolidation project that whether we could look at moving those programs to a, to a consolidated site. And the only qu reason I ask this question, Clay, is because if you look at this year alone, the proposed supplemental for this sits at $201,500. Um, and I, I'm sure that's kind of at the high end, but I, I know that they have two, they have an elementary right next door, and then they, the operations of this school are high school operations. But gen, generally, the students that attend are students who need spur wing services, if I'm correct. Is no. that Ron? Mm -hmm. Lori or Clay, yeah. you might so want to explain a, what Frank Jewett does. The alternative ed program is there, so that's a regular ed program that's about 50 students. And then there is our own in-house day treatment program, which would be a, a, a day treatment level of services like somebody who would go to Spurwink. And we have about a dozen students enrolled in that program. Uh, and so that, that's what's there now. They are, they are populations that can't just go back into the high school building. They're in another building for a reason. Oh, sorry, <laughs> for those of you, these are high school level students. So consolidating yeah. them with BCS is not happening. Yeah, so that makes sense. And then the case is that the other thing is to understand that we used to house the whole Sebago Education Alliance. There was a lot more students there, and the damage to that facility was extensive. Mm -hmm. Having this is kind of like our our own adult, no, sorry, alt ed as well as it's our own program in house. So they used to be at J Jack Memorial School across from Plumbers, and we moved them to Frank Jewett and made Jack Memorial adult ed and um, the technology office. Mm -hmm. So. It depends on, and, and originally I actually had a mom I met with today when Alternative Ed was in the old Hollis High School that the district no longer owns. So they've been moved around a lot, but uh, yeah, it wouldn't be practical to attach them to Buxton Center because it's high school programming. But they may, but our master plan may find a better place for them in district. Thank you, that was ultimately my questioning. Thanks, Lori. Any other questions about uh, Frank Jewett? All right, moving along. Back. Memorial, yeah, Jam Jack being Memorial. Jack Memorial. Uh, there was a request from the administration on the adult ed side of that building for an accessible bathroom. The only accessible bathrooms are on the technology side. They are physically separated. Um, so this was a request for the adult ed side. Exterior painting. Uh, we did do some painting of the foundation last summer. This would be to do all the, uh, the remaining trim and woodwork on the exterior of the facility. Interior painting, classrooms are in, so, in need of being repainted. It's been a while. Interior lighting upgrades, similar comments to previous. Um, and then replace the fixtures in the bathrooms. This is There's two small bathrooms. Let's see if I get this right. Huh. If you read that, you're going to get a chuckle. But <laughs> Again, that come from the administrator over there. 
They want us to raise the toilets, apparently, because the old people have bad knees. Sorry if I offended anybody. See, Izzy? I told you, Izzy. See, like bad knees. I didn't single anybody out, did I? <clears throat> Maybe just a group. All right, moving on. So just one second, Mr. Burns. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you yeah. want to load tech into this one, or you want to just do jack by itself? Oh, yeah, we can tech, tech's in jack memorial. Sorry, the, the next page is the two top two lines are from the tech, which is the next attached page to the Page 50, same building. Technology is in the opposite end of that facility. The current generator supports only the IT infrastructure for Internet. It does not support anything else in that building. Um, so this would be to replace the existing generator to support the entire facility so that IT would remain functional, 100% functional in an outage. MDR data breach service. I don't... I can speak I, to that. Yeah, I actually just got a quote from them on this. Uh, so is this... Know what that is. The only question that I would have, so is, is... Do you know if this line is specifically for your server or networking equipment or is it to offer endpoint protection on the workstations i can't answer that I, i'm gonna guess way out of my depth here but i'm gonna guess it's it's just the first thing it's not all of the workstations i think it is just the server that is gonna be my guess but i, I thought, we can, yeah sorry i, I thought agree. this was because yeah. uh, for, for sorry we don't have mr nace in here but if scott was here i, I think we, we can is, get clarity but i feel we'll pretty get clarity confident. To confirm but i think it's just the server based but for folks i mean this would it's so folks they're their big shtick is offering, you know, 24-7 service on either workstations or servers. Um, their, their response time, if something gets gets hit, it's like two minutes. I mean, so it, it's a really good s service, and that's actually not that expensive. So, yeah. Lori? Yeah. Some of you may not know that we actually were um, attacked and had, had, a, had a ransom, mm -hmm. Just, and we did lose data, and we did have to rebuild. We didn't pay the ransom, but we lost stuff. So uh, this, we we didn't. We are working hard at data breach protection and um, putting th more things in the cloud because we did lose some data because our server was hacked at, two years ago, three years ago. Yeah, and from an overall mm -hmm. cost, this. I mean, and I mean, from your cyber security and insurance pos posture, this probably actually. Is, it, it, is an overall wash if you start keep getting into that in a, into that world. So, all right. Questions about the Jack Memorial and the Tech Building, Mr. Burns. I just want to say I went to that school when it was new in 1953 for second grade. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Mary. I, 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 okay. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Whenever I talk about the, I got to call up Ken Brooks and ask him how the uh, Schoolhouse Arts, which is the old high school, was. You know, they, I, that's you know, I, I've got some people that were you know predate us, but that's a long time ago. All, All right. right. Next, next group, uh, facility, facility, direct facility related expenses, or potential expenses. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've built a new warehouse and fueling station for our bus fleet over by the bus garage. Um, this is to install emergency generators to support that warehouse and the propane filling station that we're putting in. Right now it does not have any backup and we don't have a plan for it. This $75,000 would help that. Next item is to install the well, the septic, and the bathroom at the warehouse that we originally planned to put in there and had to remove from the project to get within budget. Uh, the next item is to put a canopy at the new filling location. Uh, so bus, uh, drivers can do their filling and stand under this canopy in inclement weather. Next item is a new Ford F-550 truck or equivalent. Uh, one of our existing trucks in our fleet transmission has recently failed and is in need of a, of a replacement. And that $90,000 is not a joke. That is true. That's how much they cost. Building, uh, building room numbers. So there was a request, I can't remember, there was a parent or a citizen that requested putting or upgrading all the room numbers in all the schools. So for those of you that don't know, every classroom has a number on the interior, but also on the exterior. So when the emergency firefighters or whatever emergency personnel are coming, they can identify the room number from the outside. This, and they're usually placed on the windows. This money is to do that district-wide to apply the room number to the window and upgrade what's there today and all the buildings in the district 
And then PFAS related expenses. I'm not gonna get too far into that, but we are gonna have to absorb related expenses as it relates to PFAS even after we put in our mitigation systems. These are annual costs that we never have seen before and the cost of which of doing that business it seems to keep climbing. I can't answer why. I consider you call the main drinking water program, good luck. So any questions about facility related expenses? I will say that I am gonna look at these numbers and just see if it's worthy of taking some of these off for the warehouse, but any questions? All right, the athletics. Athletics, so you're gonna see some big ticket items here. And again, a lot of this is gonna get um, looked at and reviewed as part of the facility master plan process. So the first one, turf field stadium upgrades. For those of you who have lived in this district for any period of time, I'm sure you've heard that a turf field is almost a necessary element for our district, or at least people think it is. But I look past just the turf field, right? The track needs renovations, our current stadium seating on the home site is not accessible. The bathrooms are questionable. Um, we have no storage for athletics. The football locker room is in an old portable. If you're within 20 feet of it, you know you're there um, just because of the stench. So this is all inclusive. $11 million, that's not just to deal with a, a turf field, it's to deal with all the ancillary things that go around it. I can do, we could probably do a turf field for $4 million, but that's all we'd get, and we'd still have all the other problems around it. The athletic storage facility, again, um, athletic director asked for, they have a lot of athletic gear, so jump mats, hurdles, uh, I don't know, football gear, I mean, uh, I don't know, the, all those items currently live in scattered locations all over the place. And this would be a storage facility to consolidate all that, that, consolidate all that and to house the gators, the small like, pieces of equipment that they use. Go ahead, Lori. I was going to say, aren't we paying rent for pods right now? That's too? a valuable yes. point. Yes, I did unload three pods last year, but we still rent. At the, I think they're $110 a month. 20, 20 foot pods. We still have two of them over there at the tune of $110 a month just to store athletic gear. So, yeah, it's not a lot every month, but it adds up over time considerably. But I am working at trying to eliminate some of these pods to get rid of the rental fee. Thank you, Lori. Um, locker room upgrades, additions, probably most of you have never been in those, and I can understand that. But these locker rooms are in really bad shape. They do not meet any current ADA standards. For those of you that walked the building with us last year, you got to see it firsthand. The teams, the coaches, the athletes are always asking for lockers, for new benches, for shower upgrades, all that kind of stuff. This money would be thrown at that. And again, gonna be looked at through the master plan process pretty heavily. Baseball field upgrades. Again, I don't know if you guys are baseball fans. Home plate sits below the water table. So you can probably imagine what that's like. And of course, baseball plays in the spring, the wettest time of the year. So we struggle every year to get that playable. Every game, not just at the start of the season, but every single game, especially after a rain event. And there's a, that building that the dugout is attached to, that bathroom, not only that's all below level two. So every time it rains, there's a foot of water in that bathroom. Poorly, poorly mm -hmm. constructed but I'm not gonna get into that. At the end of the day, the $65,000 would look at the baseball field itself, oh, the playing six. surface, and the dugout space, the bathrooms, and what they have is a press box up above the dugout. Softball field upgrades, kind of a similar story. Less money needed there, the softball field is actually elevated uh, much higher than the baseball. This money would be put more towards um, the, ex the uh, outfield and the dugouts. Again, we bring all these schools into our into our community, right? And they're playing on. Well, I'm gonna leave it alone. Is there any more? Athletics? 50, yeah, sorry, you go up 51. You still got three more athletic. So we're getting close on time. Yeah, keep on going. Let me keep sorry. rolling. All right. Yeah. Uh, athletics, uh, middle school. This was a request of the athletic director. So our current irrigation system stops at a point. 
and there's about a 50 to 60 foot section of that field that is not irrigated and it's very obvious what grows from that ground. Um, so this was to extend the irrigation to add a couple zones so that we can get that grass to be as pristine as the grass next to it. Lighting, Murchy Gym, entrance and exterior. <laughs> Over time, we've lost a couple pole lights in that parking lot. Um, so these, these lights would be to add some additional light to the currently what they think is a dark entrance um, just so there's improves lighting for safety more than anything. And then the storage building for the middle school for the athletic gators. And it would be more than just the gators, but it's more storage for the entire athletic um, actions that happen at the middle school. And this could be lumped in with the high school consolidated into one facility again to be looked at through the master plan process any questions related to athletics one last section all right food service fs food service electrical again these are all requests of the food service director dotty janata um, so as you read through the description that's the descriptions that she's provided me electrical upgrades at the high school uh, just to plug in and um, bring in better equipment for the kitchen. Serving line improvements. There's a thought that um, by improving the serving line, it improves the, I don't know, the eating environment and the experience for the students. So she's asking for some um, serving line improvements. Uh, it's Steve Fall. She's asked to have the kitchen and the office painted. Steve Falls sink installation. This is related to an inspection by the state. Currently, they are not. They don't meet code. They don't have the three basin sink for washer and sanitize that you need by code in a kitchen. So this would be to install that sink in that location. HBM re paint the kitchen and serving line. And the Libby some electrical upgrades in the kitchen to for to promote. Uh, looks like refrigerator and freezer box. Georgie Jack, elect electrical up upgrades for a new combi oven. Uh, da -da -da. Yeah. Food service. Any questions about food service? All right. Go ahead. Thank yes, you, sir. Adam. Oh, oh sorry, Mr. Blyer. Thank you, Adam. Yes, sir. Just out of uh, curiosity, going through these, this whole budget line item that you have over here, um, I'm sure you didn't get estimates for everything. I just probably through your experience, just ballparking what it would cost to paint and do that. Yep. You know the types of upgrades. Is that correct? That's how you're coming up with these numbers. Yeah, that's how the conversation started tonight. Yes. Okay. So my curiosity. I know in the past that we had custodians and you know kind of um, tackled science labs and and work on projects within the school in the past. Are we looking to do that type of thing on any of these as well or these are all contractor type prices these are all contractor type prices and is there any consideration to use the, you know the employees that work for the school to take care of any of these items consideration yes absolutely thank you the dilemma we're faced with in any given day we have between 80 and 110 work orders if i take my six maintenance staff and dedicate them focus them on a project in the finite time that we have in the summer eight to ten weeks the 110 work orders grows to 200 pretty quickly. So now all of a sudden we have a backlog on all this work that we now have to try to catch up on. We'll never be able to do that. So if I dedicate my entire workforce to projects, everything else falls down. So yes, I consider it. At the end of the day, economically, it makes better sense to hire all this work out and keep my staff working on the work orders and fulfill the request of the school on a daily basis. So yeah, we definitely looked into it for sure. And there are some of these projects that we tackle in-house, the small, like the lighting replacements, the lamps, we'll do that in-house. We'll buy it, we use efficiency main money to help support it, we'll actually go do the install. But when it, call it, when it comes to a major renovation or a major, major project, can we do it? Sure. Does it economically make sense to do it? Probably not. And everybody else suffers as a result of that. All the schools don't get their work orders addressed. So it's a kind of a fine line, right? I have to 
pick and choose which ones I think make sense that are going to take the least amount of time, provide the biggest impact, and still get all of our work orders completed over the course of the summer. Todd, you have Speak to that. <clears throat> one more. Yeah. Yeah, there's, sorry, there was one ad. Sorry, Mr. Brockman. Central office. Oh, I didn't even see that. One. Renovation of the, H, uh, the HR office space. Sorry, oh, it's not your on. packets aren't up to date, but you know, Mr. Brockman gave me the yeah. heads up. That's why I wanted to get through Adam. So renovation of the HR office space, mo modify current layout to provide additional office for the HR assistant, 35000 There you go. I, just, yeah, I was just also going to speak because I was at the high school when we did the science lab renovations. It was a local project in the sense that we locally funded it with our own capital savings. And we had one guy from our maintenance department who did a lot of the carpentry, and we oversaw the general contracting of it. But we hired out plumber, electrician, yes, flooring. Correct. Like, there, there were lots of subcontractors who did the work. Yeah. All right. Our one carpenter did do a lot of work, but all the subset work was hired. That was all hired, yeah. for the most part, hired out. All right. Case has been. Okay, so. We'll do the last one. Be, make it brief. Okay. So two things. Um, the community, in my opinion, is a wonderful resource, um, including people like my father, who's aged out, he's retired, and he's a carpenter. And I think there's a lot of people in this community who would be willing to do volunteer-based work if there's legality surrounding in that I don't know what those kind of opportunities would be presented by the school and how we could reduce cost in that capacity if that's a possibility or even feasible the other thing I want to talk about lastly is the turf of 11 million dollars um, I think that Mary Hoffman Hoffman and myself should have a conversation about Poland Spring um, if they want more water from Hollis they pay a 1% surtax and um, or they can pay for our uh, our uh, athletic, uh, our turf and field. Maybe that's something that can be negotiated. So. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a policy that doesn't allow that to happen. So that would have to be revisited. Yeah, Thank talk you. Talk to them about a donation. So there's Paul. Yeah, I think that we could we for another meeting. But I think that there's a little bit of misunderstanding here. Um, we can we can. It isn't about signage. There's laws that prevent you from like naming it the Coca-Cola field because schools can't sell Coke because it's sugary, right, and bad for you. Um, but you could call it the Dasani water field. There there is policies around how we name things because there's rules like because we wanted to name everything after right citizens that have contributed. And so there's some rules around, but the board has final say on naming. It, it, even in the policy, it says that. I think it's a misunderstanding. Um, but there are a lot of rules around accepting grants and money for things. that Name it have Cooper Field. <laughs> but I will say it is an avenue that I think we should explore. Absolutely. So noted, noted, and we will yeah. look into it. And if we have to adapt policies, the board can look at yeah. that and change things yeah. if we if have to. If we could to. squeeze the money out of the Portland Water District for the, 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 the you know, for the Edna Libby thing, trust me, it's not like I, I, I know some of their directors. Now, so, now we talked about, uh, sorry, due to the cancellation of the, of the meeting on March the 2nd, uh, Eric and I, we talked about po the potentially having a meeting next Thursday night. Uh, I think there's enough discussion that, uh, Adam, would if we were to meet next week, would that give you sufficient time to revise this list? Or the meeting on the 30th? Is the, is that the you know the two options we have right now? I have We've been already added the twenty third. Yeah, it was it wasn't on the timeline sheet. I just want to make sure because it, sorry, it's when you flip to flip to the page, uh, you know, uh, fifty four, it, it wasn't unfortunately on, on the uh, packet. It's on the revised one. Okay. Not the ones up front. So to answer your question, Mr. Chair, yeah, I've been tasked with tightening up this list for next meeting. Good. Um, by the way, just so since uh, before I get a motion to adjourn, just to give you a heads up, since um, I was around since we started the BAC, uh, question five in Portland last fall was talking about how the budget is comprised. My old buddies in Scarborough, um, they've only approved one budget in the last five years in the first vote. They get them sent back to the school board and the rest of it. The B BAC was created specifically because, and I hate to say this, and I am not being disrespectful to Don or Nathan, um, or any of our school board members at the back of the room. And trusting 11 people with the fact of making decisions um, 
seems a great idea, but if you ask Ms. Black or I who've been in that room, sometimes that doesn't go the way you think it's going to go. Because then we, you know, 14 individuals, when Deb and I were on the board, now it's 11, decide that we want to replace the, uh, the ball field and we hit you with a tax increase. That is massive. And then what happens, it goes out to vote and then it fails. And then we have to go back to the drawing board. So the BAC was created specifically. The reason we need your input is because the priorities that are set here go to the, go to, to the school board. The school board has a decision. But then it has to go in front of the public and the community both in May and June. If we pass as, as a whole, we get, hand off a budget to them, I trust you the fact is that, as I said, Scarborough continually over the last five years has their first round of the budget kicked and then they have to go back to the drawing board and do it all over again. That is not what I think, uh, for time and energy of the administration and the staff, that's not the thing in making priorities. It just creates a more disharmonious community, which is why the BAC was formed, was to try to get these issues hammered out. And also, by the way, when it comes time to approve the budget, you become the greatest advocates we have. Believe it or not, every time, I've, I think I've been on the losing side of the budget vote the four out of the last five years. But then I simply talk to my neighbors and friends about why the budget's a good thing to approve of, and it passes. So that's my point on the fact of why the Budget Advisory Committee's here. We are going to meet next Thursday night, weather hopefully, you know, uh, uh, goes well. Winter's over. I've yeah. declared it. It's over. Snow days, by the way. Sorry, he says that, and of course, then like remote days and things like that. Um, the chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. Just a quick thing before we... Mr. Carlo? Um, I know it seems like we're trying to wrap up here. I just saw a couple people in here who I've never heard ask any questions here, and I, one of them raised their hands earlier. I just want to, before we adjourn finally, give them the opportunity to ask their question if they still want to ask it. Thank you, Nathan. Don't worry. Don't get me wrong. We'll, you, can, you can do it next week, too. That's what I'm going to say. It can wait till next week. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry. Sorry. I'm not I never, looking for enemies tonight. Sorry, I never leave this this room fast. All right, listen, um, motion to adjourn. Uh, Erica is the first, Mary's my second. All those in favor say aye. aye. We'll see you next Thursday.